This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion right here on TFRlive.com, Truth Frequency Radio, as well as the iHeart Radio app. Glad you are with us wherever you are joining us around the world or across this The greatest nation to ever exist on planet Earth. We are glad you are with us as we come to you from the United States of America. Broadcasting as always, as we do, from the intellectual dungeon on the outskirts of war-torn St. Louis, Missouri. You know, I I, I do that intro about every week, don't I? The intellectual dungeon on the outskirts of war-torn St. Louis, Missouri. That's always how we start off this program. And maybe to some of you, excuse me, maybe to some of you who don't live here or are not overly familiar with the St. Louis area, you, you may wonder why it is that I refer to this area as war-torn St. Louis, Missouri. Well... A lot of it has to do with what we've seen in certain incidents after the the Mike Brown case in Ferguson or the Darren Stockley acquittal here in the city. Uh, He he was a cop that had had to uh, shoot a black suspect uh, in self-defense and was found innocent of that. And we, of course, like we did in Ferguson, we had all kinds of Rioting and protesting and violence coming from the black community mainly, and and the liberal community too, uh, in response to that. So we see our share of violence here, certainly, whenever, whenever the police bring someone to justice. But beyond that, beyond that, we wake up every morning here and we turn on the news and we hear of murders every single morning when we when we turn on the news. Murders and carjackings and rapes and thefts and what have you. It's a common thing. I'm not saying it's any more or less than it is in your town, depending on where where you live. You may be in a less dangerous area. You may be in a more dangerous area. If you're in in New York City right now, you're probably laughing at me for my reaction to this, but that's fine. But to give you an illustration of why I refer to this as war-torn St. Louis, Missouri. Allow me to take just a moment, if I may, to read to you an article from KMOV.com, KMOV being the uh, local CBS affiliate, Channel 4, on our televisions here. little article from their website about this weekend in war-torn St. Louis. This article uh, was updated most recently Monday, uh, a little afternoon. It's by a man named Michael Ritter. And here's here's KMOV's synopsis of this weekend in war-torn St. Louis. Police in St. Louis are investigating 17 different shootings that left 18 people injured and three dead between Friday afternoon and early Monday morning. The first shooting occurred around 4.15 p.m. Friday in the 3900 block of Palm. According to police, 22-year-old Cornell Nelson died after being shot in the torso. About two hours later, officers found two adults and two children, a 5-year-old and 13-year-old, suffering from gunshot wounds. Three victims are in serious condition, while one child is in critical condition. 
Less than an hour and a half later, a 25-year-old woman was shot in the back in the 2700 block of Simple in the Wells Goodfellow neighborhood in North St. Louis. She was taken to the hospital and listed in critical stable condition. Then, just after 9 p.m., police re- responded to a shooting call in the 4400 block of Clarence in the O'Fallon Park neighborhood of North St. Louis, where a man in his 50s was shot in the face. Police said he is listed in critical, stable condition. The fifth shooting occurred when a man in his mid-twenties suffered a graze wound to the forehead just north of downtown near the intersection of 9th and Dixon at 10.40 p.m. He was taken by he was taken to the hospital by a friend where he was treated and released. The final shooting of the night occurred just before midnight when police found a male victim in an alley with a gunshot wound, conscious and breathing, in the 5500 block of Estol. Shortly after midnight, so for those of you scoring at home or playing along, we're now on Saturday now. Shortly after midnight, a 23-year-old was shot in the shoulder while inside Loretta Hall Park located at 15th and Cole. He was taken by hospital to the hospital by friends and listed as stable. 3 hours later, a 17-year-old and 15-year-old were shot in the 3000 block of Broadway. The victims told police they were to close business in the area when they heard gunshots. Both victims were taken to the hospital and listed as stable. About an hour later, a 63-year-old was shot in the hip while driving near South Kings Highway and Gravoy. After being shot, the victim drove to the 5100 block of Wells and contacted police. He was listed to the, he was taken to the hospital and listed as stable. Around the same time, a 27-year-old was shot in the chest in the 100 block of Shoto. An investigation revealed the victim and suspect had gotten into a verbal altercation, which escalated into a fight, during which the suspect shot the victim. The victim was taken to the hospital and listed as as critical stable. The suspect was taken into custody and two guns were recovered, police said. The fifth shooting of Saturday occurred just before 9.30 p.m. in the 2900 block of Euclid, where 27-year-old Henry Grays was shot multiple times. He was later pronounced dead at the hospital. The first shooting of Sunday occurred around 12.45 a.m. when a 26-year-old was shot in the side of the 1200 block of South 14th Street while inside his home. Police said the victim refused treatment at the scene and was taken to the hospital by a friend. Then, just after 1 p.m., a man was shot in the leg in the 1200 block of Hodemont uh, during an attempted robbery. The victim was taken to the hospital and listed in serious, stable condition. About 30 minutes later, Arian Phillips, 17, died after being shot in the neck in the 1400 block of LaSalle. According to police, a 16-year-old was taken into custody in connection with the shooting. Around the same time, police were called to the 1400 block of North 10th Street after a 23-year-old was shot in the stomach while walking with two other people in the area. The victim told police the occupants of a red four-door vehicle fired several shots in their direction. The victim was taken to the hospital and listed in critical condition. About 30 minutes later, a 21-year-old was shot in the 1000 block of Hickory Lane while taking out the trash. The victim was taken to the hospital in a private vehicle and listed as stable. The final weekend shooting occurred around 12.45 a.m. in the 3000 block of Euclid, where a woman was shot multiple times during an apparent robbery. The victim was taken to the hospital and listed as stable. According to police officers, there have been 61 murders in the city of St. Louis in 2018. This time last year, there were 57 murders. So, hey, we're going to beat our own record. So that's part of the reason why I refer to this as war-torn St. Louis. What I just read to you uh, for this weekend's scorecard of shootings and killings, etc., is not terribly out of the ordinary when compared to any other weekend, particularly now that the weather is warming up. So I do believe the uh, notion of war-torn St. Louis certainly fits. Now, uh, most of you who are familiar with this show have listened to me for a while. You understand that if I'm going to talk about local events or local stories or St. Louis stories, I'm generally going to do so if there is an element to those stories that uh, may affect you where you live or that may be national in nature. So 
For those of you who don't live here, who live anywhere around the country or around the world, listening to the sound of my voice right now, who have been wondering, my God, why are you going on and on about shootings in St. Louis for seven or eight minutes? Fear not, I'm about to get to the reason why. One would surmise, one would think, one would assume that in a city in which there is such a tremendous amount of violent crime, in a city in which the question going into a weekend is not whether or not anybody will get killed, but instead whether or, or instead the question is how many people will get killed, as though, as though Vegas would be taking over under bets on it. In that type of environment where the killing and the shooting and the robberies, to say nothing of the drug deals and the prostitution and the human trafficking, the robberies, the carjackings, where all of those things are occurring on a daily basis, so common that it doesn't surprise us, you would think that in a city of that nature that faced such depravity and such danger for their ordinary citizens and even the people from the outside who come into the city for work or leisure or whatever it may be, you would think that the officials in that city, people like your prosecutors and your investigators and so forth, you would think that in such a city, the city prosecutor's office would be spending all the time they could and leveraging all the resources they had and that were available to them in order to take scum like these killers off the streets. It almost goes without saying, right? You're in a city that's that violent, you would think your prosecutor's office would be zoned in, dedicated, focused on finding the criminals, finding the killers, finding those in society who are causing the violence and harm to others and doing whatever they could to get them off the streets. That's what you would assume. That's what you would think. That's what would make sense. However, as I have relayed to you in recent weeks on this program, the focus of the city attorney's office in St. Louis, headed by a woman named Kim Gardner, her focus and the focus of her office has not been on prosecuting criminals and thieves and drug dealers and rapists and getting them off the streets. Oh, no. The focus of her office has been on trying to jail the governor of the state of Missouri, bringing forth charges. And you recall, if you were with us, what, two or three weeks ago, You'll recall the story bringing up charges about the governor having an affair with, uh, with a woman, Katrina Sneed. We'll mention the name, even if other journalistic outlets in our town won't. We will. Her name's Katrina Sneed. The governor having an affair with this lady, which he has admitted, that part's not disputable. But the bone of contention was that during this affair, the governor, before he was governor, of course, but the soon-to-be governor, uh, had taken some nude or semi-nude pictures of Ms. Sneed and had threatened her with blackmail if she ever went to the authorities or, or, or brought out the fact that she was having an affair with him. That's what Kim Gardner and her office has been focused on. Not, not the thugs and the criminals and the murderers and the rapists and the carjackers that are a threat to you and I any time we dare to venture into the city. Oh no, no, not them! but some photograph that the governor allegedly took. That is what their focus has been. I'm mentioning this to you because late yesterday afternoon, 
the invasion of privacy charges that Kim Gardner, our city attorney, had brought forth against Governor Eric Greitens, those charges were dropped. And even more stunning development, the charges were dropped when the defense took the unusual tactic of calling Kim Gardner herself as a witness. You see, there's been all kinds of questions about the practice of Kim Gardner. We've talked about some of it here. There have even been cases where briefcases, random briefcases with fifty or $100,000 in them have shown up at the office of Katrina Sneed's ex-husband's attorney. This thing has gotten bizarre and weird from the moment go. And so, when Kim Gardner was going to be called to the stand, when she was going to be called as a witness, suddenly and miraculously, the charges were dropped. Wow. Now, that doesn't mean Governor Greitens is out of trouble yet. There's another felony case out there about, uh, in his campaign, we, he may have gotten a, a donor list from a charity, which was actually his charity. So the thought is, okay, you're accusing him of stealing from himself? Really? What the heck? But in terms of this salacious thing that Kim Gardner was all about, that has been the focus of her office for the last several months, Yesterday, it was proven to all be a lie. Now, while I understand the interest that may be gleaned from such a salacious tale, which is proven to be untrue, and while such scandal does make for good television or newspaper writing or... uh, entertainment on on social media, I suppose. There is a very real element to it all, which has a negative impact on us here in St. Louis, and I would argue maybe having a negative impact on you wherever you are. It is one thing for a prosecutor, a politician to bring about false charges against the sitting governor and go on a witch hunt and try to railroad him out of town. That's bad enough. There's no place for that. But that's what happened here. But the damage of that is compounded. And compounded greatly. When that same official, that same prosecutor, can and should be one of the primary weapons that the people in her city have to fight against the murderers, the thugs, the rapists, the thieves, the drug dealers, the pimps, the prostitutes. When she's supposed to be the first line of offense against those people. But she chooses instead not to focus on the people that put our lives in danger every day. Not to focus on the people who necessitate that we good citizens do all we can to protect ourselves and our family. That the the people that, that, that necessitate that if you do go into the city, you do not do so without being armed. She's not focusing on them. She's not focused on them. Instead, she's focused on a non issue a faux scandal with the governor. She focused on a photograph that doesn't even exist as it turns out. She brought charges against this man for taking a photo that she didn't even have in evidence. 
And meanwhile, while all of this was going on, gunshots rang out all across her city this weekend, as they did the weekend before that, and the weekend before that, and so on. I know and I understand that we live in a very politically contentious time. Not only here in St. Louis, but in America. But I am very disturbed by a trend that I'm seeing not only here in St. Louis, but across the country. And we've mentioned it before, but man, is this this an example of it that is as crystal clear as, as anything you'd want to come up with. Ever since the election of Donald Trump, we have seen Democrats go on witch hunts. Not just against Republicans in general, but against certain types of Republicans. Against the Republicans that represent the people, represent the Republican base, the outsiders. Whether it's Donald Trump in Washington, whether it was Roy Moore in Alabama, whether it was Eric Greitens in Missouri. The playbook has always been the same. Find something salacious in their sexual past, trump it up, and then when the alleged victim is asked for evidence or questioned, become all, become all, uh, all upset about it and say, "How dare you! How dare you ask for 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 evidence from a victim like this? Believe her." We even had that, by the way, protests outside the court building earlier this week, a bunch of feminazis standing there with placards that said, believe her, believe her. Well, believe what? Where was the picture? We didn't believe her for the same reason we didn't believe Stormy Daniels or any of the accusers for Roy Moore because there was no evidence. But you see, Democrats can't win elections anymore, at least not in the rural parts of, of America, not in the South, not in the Midwest. They can't win the election, so what do they do? They trump up a bunch of sexual garbage. Go after people on a witch hunt. Go after the people that win the elections on a witch hunt. And then when you dare ask for any sort of proof of their accusations, they turn on you as though you're the problem. Yeah, they did it in Missouri. They tried it in Missouri, but they're trying it everywhere, folks. And the saddest part of it all is that, well, they're focused on all of these witch hunts. Focused on trying to get good men out of office. Men that the the Republican base, that the salt of the earth voter, an American, have gotten behind. People that represent God, people that represent family values, trying to get them out of office while they're so focused on that. The very constituents that vote for them and that they allegedly represent are engaging in crime, engaging in violence all across our majorly populated areas across this country. You see, I know that liberals like to talk about vague ideas and they're always talking about, oh, how great it would be if we had government health care or, or, or guaranteed wage or whatever socialist idea garbage they come up with. But what they don't understand and what they miss is that for most of us in America today, we're, we're, not, we're not thinking in terms of pie in the sky. We're, we're not asking politicians to make the world a better place for us 20 years from now. We're capable of doing that on on our own. What instead we're concerned about is the violence of today, be it the urban thugs, be it the illegal aliens, be it the Muslim terrorists. It's the job of the government to a degree that we need a government at all to help protect us from those people. But the left is not interested in that. And we've seen that right here in St. Louis. And I fear that you have either seen it where you are or or you're about to. Their focus of this American left is not about protecting us at all. 
and not even about allowing us to protect ourselves as we see so many of them try to restrict our gun rights even further than they already are. They don't care about that. The murders, the robbers, the rapists that are all out there today, particularly in the inner cities, but even in the suburbs now, as they become more emboldened and are leaving their own neighborhoods to terrorize us in the more civilized parts of our of our populated areas. Democrats don't care about that. Other than in case they can get those criminals to come out and vote for them. But beyond that, they don't care. They don't care if you or I come into a city to do business or to have a meal or go to a sporting event. They, they don't care if you and I get shot when we go there. They don't care if you and I die, because to them, we're expendable. All they care about is getting grassroots, conservative, Trumpian, if we dare use the term, Republicans out of office by any means they can, because they know they and we are an absolute threat to their ignominious view of utopia that they're trying to force us to live through. It's sobering, but that's where the American left is these days. Folks, we'll be back with more right after the break here on TFR Live. Talk to